Hello, everybody. Reverend Charlotte Bear here. Thank you so much for joining me for this session today. Um, I am just flashing my face at you here briefly because most of the time you're going to be looking uh, at a PowerPoint slideshow I've prepared for this. Um, at the end, I will go ahead and put some references, some links uh, in the chat that you can use to follow up for a deeper dive as we don't have time during the presentation to do too much of that. Um, but I won't be able to see your comments or questions until I stop sharing screen. So thank you again for joining me uh, with this whole topic that's a thesis that's very near and dear to my heart. I've put it together for the parliament. Um, and I'm going to go right ahead right now and, and share screen. And so that is what you will be seeing. Um, so here you see in the background a, a picture of an Extinction Rebellion protester participating in a hunger strike uh, in front of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office um, in Washington, D.C. That's in 2019, so 1922, two years ago. Uh, and of course, since then, the climate crisis, the climate emergency has gotten even more dire, even more dangerous, and the sense of urgency is even uh, much, much more universally felt by more and more people and ecosystems. So I begin, why am I talking about 21st century morality? Well, morality matters. Um, it gives definition to our sense of right and wrong, good, bad. It provides a framework for living in right relationship with ourselves, with others. Um, moral principles inform ethical statements or codes of ethics, which I regard as activated morality, lived morality, and you know, ethics suggest how our core values, our deeply held non-negotiable core values become core behaviors. So, American literature professor Joseph Campbell in his groundbreaking book, The Power of Myth, made a prediction in 1988. He predicted that any religion in the postmodern age will be irrelevant unless it directly addresses the plight of the planet. And he stated, we need myths that identify the individual not with his local group, but with the planet. Campbell, of course, was a master at explaining worldviews, and I learned a lot from him about that and have paid attention to worldviews because worldviews matter. They are existential. They influence our sense of right and wrong. They affect our deeply held beliefs about right relationship with the planet, with other living beings on the planet, with each other as a species, um, and with the divine as we understand the sacred. And I'm going to discuss two worldviews in the next few minutes, and they are both evident in the world today, and in some places in fierce competition for which one can or should or will be preeminent in shaping our core values and our core behaviors. Here you're looking uh, at the egocentric worldview defined here by Merriam Webster as essentially anthropocentric. And so human beings are the most significant entity in the universe. You can see depicted here an image of a man, he, him, who's standing apart from the rest of the web of life in the center of creation. And so the anthropocentric worldview has been dominant in the West throughout the so-called modern age, 1700 through 2000. 18th through 20th century, and it, it was preeminent during this period of global colonization by sovereign naval powers who justified their conquest with the morality that's indicated in this worldview. And it, it has been characterized as egocentric. So this egocentric worldview places human beings, I'm going to correct that, places mankind, he, him, at the center of existence, at the center of sacredness, at the center of value, so much so that everything and everyone else is simply a resource for mankind. And that usually means a colonizing race. So let's be clear, what's in the center are men in a colonizing race within this egocentric 
worldview. That's the way it's manifested. And with an egocentric worldview, all moral authority is given to mankind, with mankind being formed in the image of God. And we all know doctrines and dogma that support that. So all divine and moral authority resides with mankind. And it is up to mankind then to determine the value of everything and everyone else on the planet and the planet itself. Now, the measure for such valuation have typically been what can be proven by scientific method or what conforms to the imperial or colonizing culture or by how the dominant culture determines utility. For example, does this person, does this animal, does this plant, does this ecosystem demonstrate our way of thinking, of speaking, of writing and communicating, of does it have our technological ability? Does this conform to our colonizing culture? Does this have utility that will benefit us as colonizers? The climate justice movement today is not at all shy about accusing this worldview of supporting centuries of acts of environmental degradation, ecocide, genocide, mass extinction, not to mention systemic racism, misogyny, generational trauma, and chronic atrocities committed against other species who are viewed only as products. And any number of uh, these groups of, of peoples or other animals have so often been deemed as not being sentient, not being intelligent. Uh, not being worthy of regard in that way. So this way of thinking, the egocentric worldview way of thinking stands accused of justifying and rewarding the commodification of nature, viewing the natural world in terms of the monetary or resource value to man. And within this worldview, mankind's job is to manage the natural resources given to us for our use. And in this worldview, usually God, often a male God, sanctions such a management role for mankind. And it, you know, in its most benevolent form, mankind as manager is a benign steward, compassionate and fair. In its most pathological form, mankind is an unregulated brute a plundering tyrant, cruel, chaotic. Today, cultures who never adopted their colonizer's worldview are boldly calling out egocentrism as the root of our moral crisis that is killing our planet. So now here we look at an ecocentric worldview, uh, which stands in opposition, really. Um, and it's used by environmental philosophers and ecologists to denote a nature-centered as opposed to human-centered system of values. So the ecocentric worldview sees human beings as an equally integrated part of nature. We are an equally integrated part of nature. You see the human being there is within the web of life, not apart from it, but a part of it and a co-equal member of the natural world, not more important, not more valuable, not more cherished, not more sacred than anyone or anything else. This is a worldview that within the global climate movement is expressed by indigenous leaders in North, Central, South America, Aboriginal leaders in Australia, the Pacific Islands, and among people in Western countries who are reclaiming their pre-colonized spiritual roots. So, Ecocentrism really, in effect, supports an anti-colonial movement. With an ecocentric worldview, you can't determine the value of any living being, human or non-human. You can't determine the value of a plant or an ecosystem or a tree or the planet itself by its monetary or resource value to mankind, because the natural world in this worldview has its own sacredness its own intrinsic value, whether or not humans perceive and acknowledge this. And that sacredness is simply not for sale. It is not ours to take, trap, torture, trash, plunder, etc. No one species, no one race is given supremacy over others based on some sense of entitlement or privilege. In fact, 
This world view celebrates human diversity in all of its forms and also biodiversity, encouraging us to learn from the wisdom of nature, from other species, and from formerly colonized peoples. So how does ecocentrism impact 21st century morality? Well, you, you can't commodify nature with this worldview. The bottom line is not a moral value measurement. In fact, it's immoral. You cannot demean any part of it based on your standards of or criteria for intelligence, sentience, or utility. Biodiversity is every bit as important as is human diversity because humans are a part of biodiversity. The moral community in this worldview is expanded beyond just ourselves as a species. So our ethics lived morality must include all life, human and non-human beings, as well as terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Ecocentrism is rooted in our humility as a species, not our supremacy. We are not the managers self-appointed by some imagined divine right. We are students and partners and allies with the natural world for the benefit of all life. It's about cooperative sustainability, not survival of the fittest. So on to climate feminism, you know, in June, 2020, just last year, the UN released a new report called Gender, Climate and Security, Sustaining Inclusive Peace on the Front Lines of Climate Change. This groundbreaking study stated, as this report outlines, climate change is already resulting in risks for the security of many millions around the globe. These risks disproportionately affect women and girls who are key providers of food, water, and energy, and who have fewer resources with which to adapt to those changing conditions. However, in some regions, the impacts of climate change are also leading to important socioeconomic shifts that are actually transforming traditional gender norms around economic activity, decision making, and leadership. So the report argues that such changes have the potential to open up new spaces for more inclusive peace and development processes. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, last year, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, she said, empowering women and girls is the single most important way to ensure effective climate action. Women not only have the right to participate in decision-making processes that affect everybody's lives, but they have their own specific knowledge of biodiversity and indispensable expertise. Women and girls are already at the forefront of the fight for climate justice, and their actions are inspiring and uplifting, but we all need to do more. So as the United Nations continues to track uh, gender equity and climate change, people identified as women or female uh, continue to prove to be great agents of change within the movement. And we're seeing too from research that globally women's leadership and equal participation do result in better outcomes for climate policy, for reducing emissions, for protecting land. Um, you see pictured here two climate feminists, Catherine K. Wilkinson and Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. They're co-authors of the blockbuster last year that came out, uh, the anthology and national bestseller called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. Um, in April this year, I did a, I did a presentation for Women's History Month um, featuring 40 women climate leaders who are making change. But these women, they went out and they have interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of climate feminists, transformational leaders. And they found that there are four main characteristics in climate feminism today. Uh, one, Climate feminists prioritize making change over being in charge. So it's about outcomes. Two, climate feminists tend to have a deep commitment to justice and equality as part of the process. The outcomes aren't just and equitable if the process isn't just and equitable. 
Climate feminists today respect the need for emotional intelligence as much as reason. And they take a holistic approach, um, including psychosocial spiritual. They're not only seeking rational and technological solutions for the climate crisis. Four, climate feminists recognize that building community is a prerequisite for building a better world because community holds tremendous wisdom. Having said that, there's also much better acknowledgement than earlier in the women's movement uh, about reckoning work that must be done. Before diverse groups of women can stand on the front lines together, we need to recognize and reconcile some deep social injustices of racism, xenophobia, homophobia, and class. And this has at times been difficult, even in so-called progressive circles within the women's movement. So how does climate feminism impact 21st century morality? Rigorous honesty about climate impacts. We need it. Rigorous honesty about climate impacts on caregivers and upon the whole function of caregiving, usually held by women identified as women, completely devalued in patriarchal societies as unpaid or menial work. We need to reevaluate that. And we must acknowledge and address the additional risks that are unique to BIPOC women, most especially Black and Indigenous women. We must acknowledge and address the additional risks that are particular to those living in rural areas or in poor communities, often under strict patriarchal conditions. And we must acknowledge and address the additional risks that are particular to trans, non-binary, and queer, gendered, she, her, they, them persons. So these usually marginalized voices need to be prioritized and intentionally putting them front and center at the solutions table to ensure their voices and wisdom are heard, understood, and respected at all levels. That's what climate feminism suggests strongly for a 21st century morality. Here, I'm now gonna talk about the global rights of nature movement. Um, uh, the rights of nature movement is growing exponentially worldwide. It consists of several frontline efforts that I wanna highlight. Um, courts, legislatures, constitutions, uh, customary laws of indigenous communities, uh, decisions of non-governmental organizations now all recognize the rights of nature. And the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, you see the, the flyer for their conference here. Um, they just, they just, they, they, well, they're the global authority on the status of nature and measures needed to protect the earth. Um, they just had their 2021 Congress in Marseille, France in September, and they are the world's largest and most diverse environmental network. Well, the global rights of nature movement was at the top of the agenda the entire time. Here's a pretty famous picture from uh, 2016 at Dakota No Access Pipeline um, when water protectors were starting to gain support from the US Congress and scientists fighting against DAPL. Um, that was, you know, six, seven years ago. The Environmental, Just the Environmental Justice Network say, uh, states, and hear the language here, rights of nature is a way of rethinking our relationship with nature from one of dominance to one of sharing, caring, respect, and interdependency. It can also act as a catalyst to shift our thinking from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. Now, the idea of nature having rights is not new. Nature has rights and, and it's been recognized by certain worldviews and cultures all along, but what is new now is how we can intervene using rights of nature as a legal argument and approach to stop the plunder. So affording rights of nature is now really vital because quite honestly, our laws, our policies, our environmental systems, they were designed to sort of curb or reduce the amount of plunder, but they were never designed to stop it or to prevent it from happening. Um, so, so this is new. This is new. Here you see here, uh, the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature is uh, one of the leading rights of nature networks. 
um, in the world. It's known as GARN. Now, the moral view of GARN is ecocentrism all the way. It says the interests of non-human beings are of equal importance to human interests and that we as human societies need a fundamental paradigm shift in how we relate to nature. Whoa. Garn says this is a matter of our survival as a species. So it's core. It's not negotiable if we are to survive. So this paradigm shift involves creating an approach to law, jurisprudence, that treats nature as a fundamental rights-bearing entity. That is huge. Meaning animals, plants, ecosystems are rights-bearing entities entities. If corporations can be people, plants, animals, ecosystems can be rights-bearing entities. This is a game changer. It's a game changer, and it's actually holding up in courts of law. Beginning to. Needs to keep pressing forward. So one of the game-changing things that GARN has been doing is the International Rights of Nature Tribunals. It was first created in 2014, been going on now for eight years. And the tribunal aims to create a forum for people from all around the world to speak on behalf of nature, to protest the destruction of the earth, often sanctioned by governments and corporations, the postmodern colonizers. And it also makes recommendations about earth's protection and restoration. And the tribunal has a, a really strong focus on enabling indigenous peoples to share their unique concerns and solutions about land, water, and culture with the rest of the global community. So back in 2015 with the, the Paris Climate Agreement, you know, before COP21, when all the leaders were starting to gather, a journalist, uh, Jeremy Lent, was in Paris, and he shared his perspective on the impact of the Rights of Nature Tribunal as a turning point for our planet. He wrote, this week here in Paris, we saw what may turn out to be a major milestone in the history of humankind, and I'm not talking about COP21, but about a two-day tribunal which may turn out to have even greater impact on the future direction of our world. It was a rights of nature tribunal, and it represents the most recent step in an important and hopeful journey for humankind, the recognition and expansion of legal rights. So if you're a legal junkie, this is really big stuff. Now, another thing GARN has been developing is the GARN Youth Hub, really for over 10 years now, engaging youth from all over the world. Um, in lobbying their governments and thinking about climate solutions and climate change, climate activism. So this year, this year, July 15th of this year, the Rights of Nature Declaration was published for the first time by the Earth Law Center and the Garn Youth Hub. It's called Youth and the Rights of Nature Movement, Shifting the Paradigm for All Future Generations. First time ever this is published. And the declaration was created entirely by youth and drafted in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, German, and Hindi. I just want you to hear some of the words of this. This is so incredibly moving to me. It says, and I'm quoting, youth hold unique and tenacious capacities to shift the current anthropocentric paradigm toward a future in which humans exist in harmony with the whole of the earth community. Youth are now born into a world that is overburdened with pollution and in which the Earth's very life-enabling cycles are endangered by growing crises such as climate change, biodiversity loss, and the global COVID pandemic. We recognize that despite growing international norms and conventions, conservation targets have not been met and actions are insufficient to prevent further degradation and pollution. We recognize that humans are a part of Mother Earth and that we must transform the current anthropocentric paradigm that assumes humans have ownership and dominion over the earth. We recognize the solidarity we share with other humans and social justice and environmental justice movements, and we seek to recognize and support equal equally the rights of nature for future generations, for local communities and indigenous peoples. We are nature, business as usual is no longer an option. Whew. 
One other thing I really want to lift up about the rights of nature movement, because it is um, the most imperiled part of it, uh, are earth defenders. Earth defenders are, as I say, the other part of the rights of nature movement that we may or may not talk about in spiritual circles, religious circles, but I think we sure as heck should. They are in the war zones, increasingly under attack. Their work is critically important. Earth defenders are advocates, they're organizers, they're trainers, they're educators, they're connectors. They live in peril because they are usually the very last line of defense for frontline communities and ecosystems against complete ecocide. December 2008 marked the 20th anniversary of the UN Declaration on Human Rights, and it featured Earth Defenders. That was three years ago. And the scale of Earth Defender murders indicated a truly global crisis. Uh, indigenous peoples are on the front line and vastly overrepresented in the number of Earth Defender murders each year. Other threats, less than murder, uh, include torture, disappearance, physical violence, rape, criminalization, anything from like a legal arrest to just, hey, arbitrary detention, defamation, and libel laws to silence earth defenders. Oh, and of course, digital surveillance. Thank you, drones. Women earth defenders, she, her, they, them experience additional gender specific threats, anything from sexualized messages to extreme sexual assault. So once again, gender is weaponized in these climate justice war zones. You're gonna see depicted here a woman, Namonte Nenkimo. I, I first saw this woman several years ago at a Bioneers conference and she was very impressive along with her colleagues who journeyed from the Amazon to share their story. Uh, the Monte Nenkimo, she's a Weorani leader with a group of Weorani women, and they, they here, they here, uh, shut down a legal hearing with song, protesting the conditions under which their case for sovereignty over their traditional lands in the Amazon was being tried. Many of the Weorani representatives wore what you see here, traditional dress in court. They had red bars painted across their cheekbones and brows. They were singing a song about their traditional role as protectors of the forest, and they drowned out the judge and the lawyers until the judge finally suspended the hearing. A few days later, a three-judge panel ruled in the Weyerenni's favor, finding that their territory could not, in fact, be included in an oil auction. So this ruling is a really important precedent, which um, could impact other indigenous groups whose lands are also up for oil exploration or extraction with access to so much clean green energy that can fuel the entire planet. There's absolutely no excuse and it's being driven by monetary reasons. Then Kimo reported the night before the verdict that she dreamed about the case and she woke up feeling confident that they would win. She said she carried, she carried her spear to the courthouse as a symbol she said, in my blood, I felt my grandfather, my other ancestors who protected their territory at the tip of the spear. And when the verdict came down, she was so overwhelmed with happiness. And she told a reporter, she said, we have shown the government to respect us and other indigenous people of the world that we are guardians of the jungles and we're never going to sell our territory. So cases like this, the pushback by Earth Defenders is growing. Uh, they're very popular, by the way, but at huge cost to Earth Defenders, um, they don't have the resources that corporations have. You know, it's the same old story. And they need so much more support from all of us. Um, and, and if that weren't clear enough, I mean, in April last year, 2020, a coalition of 30 Latin American journalists unveiled a new report called land of resistance and it focused on the dangers that face environmental activists in latin america the report concluded that defending the jungles the mountains the forests the rivers of latin america has never been as dangerous as it is now they documented more than 1300 attacks on earth defenders in 10 years 
in Latin America alone. And that, you know, that's an average of three murders of, an, of Earth defenders every week. And they happen in remote regions where the government law enforcement are scarce. The killings involve conflicts related to expanding mining, logging, deforestation, damming, and unregulated agriculture. Earth defenders who oppose such activities get portrayed as terrorists, as extremists, as anti-development, as unpatriotic even. I personally think, and I'm speaking as a US veteran, former warrior, I think it is immoral for us to sit in relative comfort and uh, safety while earth defenders fight these battles. So how does rights of nature impact the 21st century morality? It, it redefines who and what is a rights-bearing entity. Whoa. Human rights, animal rights, nature rights are the domain of law, legislation, and law enforcement. And human societies need a fundamental paradigm shift in the way we relate to nature. Wealthy elites, powerful institutions must be held accountable, period. Youth will hold the rest of us accountable. Their fight is our fight. We're the adults in the room. And we must lift up the courage, positive warriorship and sacrifice of earth defenders and more than lift them up and acknowledge their lands. We need to be getting in there and helping them with these battles for sovereignty. Because research has shown that when indigenous peoples have sovereignty over their traditional lands, those ecosystems are protected. The war zones today are clearly delineated. There's not much ambiguity. You just follow the money, you'll see them. And the battlefields continue to be very bloody. Moral leadership must side with frontline earth defenders against all forms of ecocide and genocide. And those who are used to being in power need to recognize their privilege and walk with cultural humility and openness to learning, because there's a steep learning curve for some of us. I, I'm going to say here, the, the last observation I'll make is an underlying expectation across the board in the climate justice movement that I hear in so many ways, um, and that is that core values are not enough. Mission, vision statements, they're not enough. Uh, ethical statements, they're not enough. Core values must become core behaviors with accountability. And moral leadership is going to need absolute credibility by leaders living core behaviors that are transformational with real outcomes. Nothing less than that will do. Um, Greta Thunberg, and I, I happen to love Greta Thunberg because she simply will not be patronized. I love it. And she says uh, within this now infamous blah, blah, blah statement she made recently. She, she says, hope is telling the truth. Hope is taking action. And hope always comes from the people. People of faith and faith leaders are people of hope. We have our marching orders. If you doubt it, let's take a listen. I've got just about a two minute clip I'm gonna try to play for you here. Let's see if it works. This is not about some expensive, politically correct, green act, bunny hugging, or blah, 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 build back better, blah, 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 green economy, blah, 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 net zero by 2050, blah, blah, blah. Net zero by 2050, blah, 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 net zero, blah, 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 climate neutral. Blah, blah, blah. This is all we hear from our so called leaders. Words, words that sound great, but so far have led to no action. Our hopes and dreams drown in their empty words and promises. Of course, we need constructive dialogue, but they've now had 30 years of blah, 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 and where has that led us? But 
of course, we can still turn this around. It is entirely possible. It will take drastic annual emission cuts, unlike anything the world has ever seen. And as we don't have the technological solutions that alone can deliver anything close to that, that means we will have to change. We can no longer let the people in power decide what is politically possible or not. We can no longer let the people in power decide what hope is. Hope is not passive. Hope is not blah, blah, blah. Hope is telling the truth. Hope is taking action. And hope always comes from the people. Yep, so I have here references and uh, I can go ahead and copy those in the chat for you if you wish to do a deep dive about any of the organizations or efforts I've mentioned. At this point, I'm gonna stop share um, and I will go ahead and, and copy these references real quick um, for you and, uh, excuse me, put them in the chat and then I'll see if there's uh, any comments or, or questions that I have time to address. Okay, uh, thank you so very much. Um, in the chat, here we go. And if you scroll up, you'll see all of them. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I look forward to uh, having further conversation about with this about this with any of you going forward. Blessed be, so mote it be.